Okay. All right. Uh, okay, good morning. No, it's good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the second of our fourth part series on grant writing. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, the mic is not for projection purposes, but it's to capture the content for our recording that we'll share with folks who weren't able to be here today. Uh, my name is Amy Zandrati. I'm a professor here in the School of Social Work, and I'm the director of the University Grants Academy this year for academic year 17 18. And this series of workshops is a part of that University Grants Academy, a part that's open to the entire campus community. Okay. Um, so today's workshop is on drafting a budget for a RISCA grant proposal. Hopefully everybody in the room is super familiar with the term RISCA, which stands for Research, Scholarship, and Creative Activity. It's a general term that refers to that category of work in the academic life. It is not an, uh, specific to the internal opportunity here at San Jose State that's called the Central RISCA Award. RISCA is a general term. So we're talking about drafting a budget for an external grant opportunity in the system. And what we're going to do uh, today is have um, introductions of our presenters and five second introductions of all of you. Talk about the components, what goes into a budget, um, the different parts of the budget package, which includes the actual spreadsheet budget, but also the budget narrative or budget justification. Uh, we're going to give you some tools uh, and show you some examples so that you can get started on drafting a budget right now this afternoon. And there'll be time at the end of the information portion of the workshop uh, for actually you to dive in and actually draft a budget yourself, which we strongly encourage you to do. Okay, so um, before we introduce our presenters, uh, it was suggested last time that we had a workshop that we introduce people here. It looks like there's a good number of people. So just stand up, your name, your department, and that's it. Starting at this table on the end. Hi, I'm And it's wonderful to see such a, uh, a lot of folks from across all the colleges. Uh, so now I'll introduce the folks who are here to present. As I said, I'm Amy Zimbrady. I'm Jim Muller, the Associate Dean of the, the Office of Research. 
uh, Evelyn Johnson, Grant Manager for the Cochran Division. Michelle Smith, Corporate and Foundation Relations Officer with the Power Foundation. Hi, come on in. Thank you for coming, Michelle. Oh, we're just doing introductions of our presenters. So oh. do you want to come on over here by the mic and oh, tell us who you are? Hi, I'm Angela Ao. Um, I'm Senior Sponsored Programs Manager at the SDSU Research Foundation. Okay, so um, so Michelle Vaccaro was who we thought we were going to be here. That's not who's here. Got a migraine this morning. Oh, I'm so, sorry. So Angela is uh, standing in for Michelle. Okay, Jill, do you want to talk us through the grant proposal yep. life cycle? So if you remember the last time when we, we had the first workshop, we talked a little about how to generate your idea. And when we look at this cycle, we have a different step that we can consider. Well, the, the, the second is finding funding, but as you know, we will do this one a little bit later because uh, we wanted to go into the most important uh, aspect of the, the cycle uh, during those workshops. So today we will be mainly talking one of the steps in developing and submitting your proposal. And in fact, in the one that we will be discussing today, it is how to start the structure, which is one of the main components of your uh, one proposal that will be very important when you submit a grant proposal. And after, well, of course, you can see that once you have the submitted, you have the module, you have the award negotiation with the funding agency, the award setup with either the research foundation or the tower foundation, depending on the nature of your funding. And after, this is where you start to manage your project. And at the end, you will have to go on with the research. This is the book here. Uh, at one proposal, you may have annual reports to be submitted to your funding. So this is where we are in the life cycle of a grant proposal. And as I said, today we'll be talking about the budget. Before you go on, can I make two comments that I forgot to say that I wanted to say first off? And I think there are things we want to mention at each workshop. And that is that San Jose State, we have two auxiliaries that help you put forward grant proposals, external grant proposals, and you use a different auxiliary depending on the nature of your funding source, federal or private. So uh, the Research Foundation represented today by Angela Au is the auxiliary that you use when you're putting forth a proposal to a public funder, like the government or the county or the state. And the Tower Foundation is the auxiliary you use if you're putting forth a proposal to a private funder like a foundation. And that entity is represented by Michelle and Evelyn. So that's important to know. Um, if you're not sure which one you need to go to, you can always talk to Gilles Mueller in the Office of Research and he'll help you figure it out. The second thing I wanna say before we dive into all this stuff about the budget is that if it seems overwhelming or difficult to do, don't worry at all because the alternative to doing it on your own with your Excel spreadsheet is to sit down with your sponsored programs manager at the Research Foundation or your corporate foundations relations officer at Tower and just tell them what you want to do in your project. And they'll create a spreadsheet for you that is your budget, okay? So if at any point today it starts to feel like too much or overwhelming, never worry. You can always just sit down with one of these people and talk to them and they'll create the budget for you. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Another point I would say that you shouldn't hesitate to work with uh, either the research uh, foundation or the Tower foundation because they will help you a lot to develop your project. Because uh, you will see that uh, when you will talk to the later, you need to have some specific information for instance about the benefit. But that is the cost of this thing. It depends on your personal uh, uh, situation. They have all of this information for the grant committee. So don't hesitate because they are uh, here for uh, all of us and it's much easier if you work out to them at the beginning than at the end. So take advantage of that. So speaking of uh, the budget, 
So first, when you look, again, as I said earlier, about the grant proposal, when you look at the different uh, components that you have in the grant proposal, the one that you are always familiar, this is the one that you will mainly develop in the project narrative. This is where you will be discussing about the idea, why it is important, what the novelty that you will bring, why it is of interest for the people in your area of the city. So that's one. Then we also have the budget, as we will talk in the later. And then, depending on the funder, you need to provide other forms that are required when you submit your grant proposal. And this is another aspect. Most of the time, all of those forms will be prepared for you and you will be working again with the Research Foundation or the Tower Foundation. And they help you with uh, filling out all of those forms because each funder may have a different uh, requirement to look at what is needed in terms of your but today we will focus on the budget. So in the terms of the budget, so what's the purpose of the budget? So first, as I said earlier, you have ideas. But if you want to develop your ideas, often you need to purchase some equipment, material, supplies, or you need to support yourself or research assistance. By research assistance, it could be students of other people, or you need consultants, collaborators, and there are different ways that you need help for developing your project. And that's why this is a way to look at what we need in terms of all the costs and the sources of funding that you will be using to support your idea. And this is very important. The second point, when you look at that, often your idea that you would like to develop or to put uh, in the theory uh, why is an art? You need to look at how is it possible that I can do it. And if you don't have the financial support, you need to work on it. So that's another aspect. But one that's also very important in a way to look at the project is that you also always think about the project in terms of the narrative that what you want to do. But the other another aspect to look at the grant proposal is to put in number what you really want to do. So when you look at the grant proposal, it, so the budget can be also numerical description of what you want to do. And I would say that often when you look at the grant proposal, by reading the top of the world that you plan to do, and then looking at your budget, you can have an idea if there are some, what I would say, red flags or not. Or not so often the, the budget is really a good idea to the reviewer if the PI, for example, is plug all the numbers that will show that what he or uh, she wants to do can be done. So that's very important. So it's always important. And this is where the help of the research foundation and the Tower foundation can help you for that to make sure that your budget is a good summary of what you want to do. Because if you don't have a good budget, that is your first problem, uh, and you may be in a situation where the reviewer may not recognize your one proposal for being funded by the funder. So when we talk about the budget, there are two components that we consider. The first one, this is the one that is directly uh, depending on you. In fact, this is what we call the direct cost, and in a way, Sometimes when you read the announcement about the grant opportunities, you can see that the, there is the, the use the language total cost. So in fact, the total cost is a combination of the direct cost and the indirect cost. But when we talk about the direct cost, it means it's anything that the funder will allow that you can uh, budget in your proposal. So as I said, it could be faculty support. Uh, hiring research assistants or uh, looking at supplies or other needs that are to travel to the conferences in case because you need to go to an archive or other alternatives to do your job. So all of those aspects will be in the direct cost as long as it's allowed by the funder. That's another point. It's always important that you read carefully the announcement of the Funder for funding opportunities because some of them may have different. And again, as I said earlier, the 
research foundation and the Torah foundation are very important for that because they can help you. They can tell you in advance what you are thinking, can be transferred for your subject. The second point is the indirect cost. And this is something that directly, in a way, if not what you think, would be put in your budget. But when you do your work, for example, you use your office or a lab or other uh, resources from the university. So basically, if you use water, electricity, phone, all of those uh, resources, in fact, someone has to pay for. And in fact, this is all it is included in your grant proposal. It's in the it's based in the indirect cost where we have oops, where we have all of those uh, institutional costs <coughs> that are needed so you can perform your work. So that's the reason why you will see that most of the, the funding agencies are put on the federal side for uh, the non-profit organizations to research this fund. But this is what you may see in your uh, grant proposal in terms of the budget. At the end, you have a percentage of uh, the total cost that will be considered in the cost. I think so far, this is where I am. Uh, as already mentioned, these are your common direct costs. Personnel uh, fringe benefit is one of the ones that uh, a lot of people confuse as sort of indirect cost, but it is uh, calculated into your direct participant cost, uh, equipment, travel, attention. One, can I interrupt you for one yeah. second? One, because sometimes it's not unclear what that word fringe means and what kind of cost we're referring to. So if you want to tell, what, what does that cover? Um, it's basically your, your kind of like your tax benefits with in hiring an employee. I'll call it that. Oh. I mean, so it, it can be your health because it depends on if there's a part time or full time person. So, and those rates vary as well. Um, I think it's one of those very important times to get a hold of some, you know, whoever your person is at the Research Foundation or the Power Foundation because a lot of times people don't realize exactly what their personal fringe benefits rate might be. If you're working with a collaborator on campus, you have to know what theirs is. Um, if you're working with students that are part-time or full-time, there will always be a fringe benefit associated with it. Um, and you might think, oh, I'll just throw some students in there. No, you actually need to calculate them because they're working on your project. So this is one of the, the sections that's most important to make sure that you're getting the accurate information so that your numbers come out appropriately and you can figure out whether or not this, um, you know, this budget fits into the project that you want to do. And it, it used to be the case that there was one uh, fringe rate for a faculty for a federal grant that was the same for every faculty member with like 40% or something. And then they changed that a number of years ago. So now the fringe rate will vary by faculty member depending on your, I, as far as I can tell, it's mostly about health care costs. So yes. I'm the primary first earner for my family. All my family members get health care for San Jose State. So my costs are, I don't know, 65% or <laughs> Really high. So for if, if you're on somebody else's insurance, your friend rate might be really low. So it's tough to estimate just ballpark, and it's really one of those traditional points at which you want to consult with your sponsor program manager. If you're if you're ballparking today and these folks can't help you specific, put 50 percent, and then you can refine it when you get the actual rate when you work directly with the sponsor program. If, and we have that list. It's, it's provided to us every month with everybody's exact you know, point, whatever, whatever. So it's very specific to you and we can provide that to you when we meet with you. That's correct. And that's, I mainly look at that rate when we talk about your release time. When you're calculating that, your summer rate would be different under tower. And that would be at 38%. But we can, during the workshop part, we can discuss that. But I've seen it range from an emeritus faculty that was like 1% to 68%. That's how great they can vary. And then you've got your consultants, subcontracts, and other costs, uh, like publications, marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you could just repeat the questions into the mic. You asked what participant costs would be? 
Uh, they vary by your type of project that you're wanting to do, but say you have um, a project where you're getting people like students are participating or you're doing, I guess, maybe teachers or students surveying or um, if you're surveying people as part of your study and you need 300 people to complete a study, those would be the participants. They're not employees, they're just doing a one-time thing or teachers that come to, you're providing a service where teachers come to a training and perhaps there's a, a stipend for that daily participation of those teachers and that's the only time you see them, that would fall under participant costs. Any other questions? And then we get to your faculty pay option where we talk about your overload beyond your 100%. You have a, a cap of 125%. And then as you work with Tower Research, we can help you actually calculate what that can come out to be. Uh, your release time, uh, time to work on the project, usually three or six that you can use. When I, we've mentioned about the 0.21 course release or 0.4. Uh, similar with your salary, pay for time this afternoon. We'll work on the project during the break. Pays based on regular salary and calculated on a daily basis. This would be the rate where I mentioned it's not the same as your release time, it's under the tower. So, just a few more things to think about. You, you can choose one of these, you can do a combination of them. It depends on what you need to do the work and what the funder allows. So, um, release time is a great option because then you get time to devote to do the work you study, right? But it can be expensive, and sometimes your chair may not be able to release you. You have to teach a class, or you've already got some other releases, or whatever it is. It may not be possible, but it's an, I, I think it's an ideal strategy because then you get time to devote to project and how precious time is. Um, maybe a lot of the work can happen over the summer. And then you can build in summer salary. If the work's going to continue over the academic year, and either you've already bought out time or your chair can't release you, sometimes an option is giving what's called overload, which means you pay yourself above your 100% salary, whatever you earn, from the grant fund. And that's built into the budget. Not all, that sometimes uh, concern for some deans. So, for example, in CASA, uh, that's the college I'm in, the dean is hesitant to allow overload, particularly for newer faculty. And that's because, by definition, you're working more than 100%. And, uh, you know, something's got to give. You're going to relinquish some of your personal time with your family or your social life or whatever in order to do this, or it's going to be squeezed somewhere else. And she doesn't want it to be squeezed from somewhere else because that would be your piece. And um, she wants to make sure that you are giving your students your 100%, you're doing great on your soap, fulfilling all your service obligations, and you're going to go up for tenure when you want to cut off. Right? So her concern is you want to make sure that you're, if you're doing overload, that it's not going to endanger your, your steady progression through the RTP process. Um, so in, in the case of profit, it's not forbidden, but you need to be able to make a strong case that you're you're doing fine and you're going to continue to do fine and short of the RTP, even if you're working in overload. And then I think some, are there funders who don't allow this? I don't know. There are definitely some that won't allow the least time. There are some, for instance, uh, if you look at the federal agencies, the overload is not uh, typically allowed by them. So for NSF, you can only do a combination of the release time and the summer or winter uh, or only one of them. Another point, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but when you talk about those options for you in terms of what you want to do, overload, release time, summer, winter salary, talk to your chair as soon as possible. You are working on a grant proposal in advance to make sure that your chair is aware and that uh, he or she will approve whatever you want. You may want to talk to them. I mean, the, and then either the chair will call the, 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 the team or the chair will say, oh, you need to talk to the team too. So you want to have them on the same uh, understanding than you, and you want to avoid that uh, at the 
and one day after our two months of the bar, that this is where the question is on, uh, uh, on the table and it's where it may not be possible to address the question. But keep in mind, it's always good to talk to the chair about those actions. Just an example of how to calculate it out. As you can see, we use the, the CSC contract rate. That's why we say budget around 50% if you're not sure. And uh, the summer grant rate can vary between our and research foundation. Our current rate is 14%. And the release time was for summer. Yeah, so in this example, they're doing a combination of, of the lease time and summer salary. Uh, so you see that, and then they just print uh, a set of it separately, and it's a different rate during the academic year and during the summer. So again, you know, oh, yeah. I'm just wondering, I've seen another example too, like the summer days seem to be pretty standard. Is there sort of a standard how many days are in the summer? Yeah, that's actually what I've heard. Oh, so what is the typical um, calculation for our number of days during the summer? And I was saying that it's uh, it can vary between 40 and 42 days um, for the entire summer. Uh, for one month, we usually use 21 to 22 days. Um, but it, it depends on what the PI wants to sort of budget in. We've had um, budgets where they have maybe did, did five day summer, um, you know, the whole 42 day summer, just depending on your project and how you sort of see fit um, with your research. That's how we basically calculate your salary. And are there days during winter break that are normal? Yes, so the, during the winter break, I believe there's about um, in January, December and January, there's some days there before the actual semester starts. I want to say it's 13 days, if I remember, right? I haven't had too many budgets of those, but we, we are able to do the winter days also. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What we will do uh, we will send you uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> And the recording when it's available. One of the other benefits of getting a hold of your your appropriate person at either the research foundation or tower is that a lot of the proposals that you're going to be doing they may be multi-year, um, or the funder may take a really long time to give you an answer. So um, what we can do is sort of project out for you. This may be the rate right now, and maybe we're expecting a point something change in that during the next year. So we'll help you plan some of those things. So again, there are lots of there are lots of reasons, but some of these things that are a little bit variable. By getting a hold of us, we can let you know shouldn't be an issue. This is the number we can use, or you, know, you have a five-year proposal. <laughs> we need to budget in some increases because if you get the award, it's not like you can go back in the middle and say, oh. I need some more money from the funder. So you want to plan ahead for that um, kind of thing. And that's part of what our role is, is to make sure that you've got that built in for yourself. You talked about indirect costs. And sometimes people um, don't understand why we have to charge for fees and why there are indirect costs built into a budget. <laughs> um, the indirect cost is basically, you know, I think Jill touched on, touched on it earlier where it's everything that is sort of available to you as a resource from the campus. Um, we have the light, the air conditioning, the heater, the coffee machine, everything like that, the cost of business, um, the cost of administering your project, um, both as you submit and also managing the project post-award. Once you get the money, the administration of, you know, collecting timesheets and invoicing and um, sort of keeping track of all your expenses. That's part of the indirect cost. So a lot of faculty may not sort of look at it that way. It's almost like, well, you're tacking on this rate 
on top of our budget request. So you're taking funds from our sort of budget to sort of pay this IDC rate. But if we don't have that IDC rate, then we wouldn't really be able to do the project. So um, for on-campus research, I believe the rate right now, the current rate is 44.5% for research. Um, if you're doing your proposal or your project off campus, it's 26%. So the way you determine that is if more than, if 50% or more of your project is going to be done somewhere else off campus, then you would use the 26% rate. Um, if only a portion of it, you know, maybe you're just going to be flying down to DC for a conference or for a week to sort of obtain um, survey results from some participants. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be an off-campus project because that would only be for one week of, of your project period. So, um, yeah, so we, we um, this was created by the Research Foundation applied a number of years ago, and it's, it's an attempt to emphasize all the, all the parts of work that happen that you might not even sort of notice that they happen, but they're actually costs for doing research a project, and they have to be paid for. And the work is outside of your teaching work and your service work. So the funding for all this stuff has to come from the research. And so what that means is you're doing an on-campus study for a federal grant and the rate is 44.5%. That means if you have a hundred thousand dollar project, you're gonna take a hundred thousand dollars to do the work of the project, you're looking for a grant of a hundred and forty-four thousand dollars in project. Four, four, five, right? Because that forty-four point five percent also has to be funded, and some of that um, it, uh, goes to pay for the research foundation, for all their staff, for processing, for the paycheck, for all the work that they do there, and some comes back to the university to pay for the lights and the computer and things like that. And the university also ensures that a portion of those funds uh, feed back to the and go to the Office of Research to fund some of their initiatives and go to the colleges to fund some of their initiatives. So the FNA, um, it pays for the administration of the work and it also pays to support ongoing scholarships for their um, The other thing too is um, for certain uh, funding agencies, they may have a budget limit of 100,000 but that could be either the total project costs or the total direct costs. So sometimes it'll say 100,000 direct costs and then we can tack on the 44% or the 26% on top of that. And I each said that, yeah, yeah. Um, just that you know, what she's describing um, and what you've just heard um, is for the Research Foundation. Is there a separate tariff slide right, right after this? Or should I go ahead and mention the different rates? Okay, one of the differences um, between working with Tower um, or the Research Foundation is the indirect costs are a little bit different and whether or not money comes back is a little different. The theory behind it is exactly the same. It's to cover all of the different costs that need to have, um, need to be paid for in order for your project to happen. For Tower, um, for grants, it's a 10% and it doesn't matter if it's on or off campus um, and that covers all of the same kinds of things. There is no, funding that comes back to the college, is it the college of the department? Um, um, so that it doesn't come back, but it's 10% um, is, is sort of what the standard is. There are some slight variations if the funder doesn't allow 10%, um, and then we'll, we'll adjust according to what the funder permits so that you can still apply, but the standard rate is 10%. Power only charges 10%, but the research foundation is 45%. I think I'll run my grant to power. That's not an option. You don't select your possibility that's better for your funding. You have to select the possibility based on the nature of the funding. Public funders, private funders. And if you end up someplace and that's not the right ability for your type of funder, they'll just send you over to the other one. Okay, can you? So this is um, just a breakdown of our research foundation rate. Um, On campus training or instruction is 
team. So that's if your research is for developing a workshop and you're sort of holding a, a program for maybe other faculty or other teachers, um, maybe K-12 teachers that are coming in um, and you're giving them sort of a training workshop. Um, that would be the rate that we would use on campus. Um, same with research, if you're doing your research on campus, using your lab, using the facilities and the resources that you have available to you, um, you go with the 44.5. Other is 46.6, um, um, but, so other, it can kind of vary from, it's basically anything that is not research. So we, I think I have one grant that was, um, it had to do with creating a film and the faculty needed to sort of, um, I think the, fun, the funder was coming in to, for the faculty to sort of develop a script and, and run the script over with um, other executives who were helping her with the film. It wasn't necessarily research, it wasn't necessarily training, but it kind of fell into the other side where she's receiving funding, uh, funding and she's receiving an award, but it doesn't fall into in either of those categories. Um, so then we have, so moving forward, we have the off-campus research team. Anything off-campus is a 26 um, Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, this is basically the calculation of the SNA. Modified total direct costs, that is your total direct costs minus um, your participant costs, and also subtracting out um, Sub, a portion of the subcontractor's cost. So if you have a subcontractor on your budget, let's say if you're working with um, UCSF and they're requesting, you know, 100,000 in year one or each year for a two-year project, um, we would only charge $25,000. Um, you would only charge IDC or FNA on $25,000 of their amount. So, we don't, no? Okay. No, no, I'm just saying that, uh, all you need to know <laughs> is that there's something called the MTBC. They calculate it for you. The FNA is calculated on the remainder. So don't, yeah. uh, if you really want to learn the ins and outs, you can consult with your person, but don't bother your head with it. Yeah. <laughs> so this just shows you, you know, what that they, they, they subtract that out, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Here's the result. They calculate the FNA based on that, the 44.5, and then it's added on to your total cost. And like what Amy said, you can just tell us you have a sub, we work with your sub, we do all the calculations for you and give you the final number. So you don't need to get into all that, it's just me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So now we have seen uh, different uh, categories for the project. The most important one is that you have all the numbers that you show for your uh, ideas that when you develop know your project, you have to be careful. As I mentioned earlier, when I, I went through uh, a few uh, topics about the budget, the first one, which is very important, is you need to be cost-effective, but really realistic on what you can do. Don't go much over what you need. So typically, for viewers, you will see that. So you need to make sure you know what you want to do. You think about all the needs that you will be uh, needed to support in a way. And from there, you need to look at all the details, a good budget for your proposal, and to say you see what the funder is committed to support. So that's very important because usually uh, experience for the world will see that. Either if you didn't budget enough, or enough. Both ways, it's not good. So you need to make sure that you have uh, all the information needed. And another point, as I just said, yes, you don't want to be underfunded because otherwise you cannot do your work. And the same, an excellent follower will be seen that. So if you haven't budgeted with all what you need to do, maybe you wonder, really, does this person know what it takes to do this project at one year or several years? That's why it's very important. So basically, I will tell you one example. So, so when I am uh, 
perspective to run you a point proposal from NSF or NIH, I do two things. Before I read the complete proposal, I look at your third page, the top of the work, and then I go directly to the project. By reading the top of the work and the project, I have a good idea already if there will be some uh, challenges or weaknesses in your proposal. Because the budget, as we said earlier, is good to plug numbers in what you want to do from your part. So often, uh, people, when they are uh, requested uh, to uh, uh, review a point proposal, they get so many, and as you know, they can't spend hours on that. So what they do, they read often the top of the world, they look at the budget for free, and then depending on that, they spend more time on the rest of your time. So that's why it's very important when you develop your uh, a proposal. The narrative is important, but the budget is also very important. So to, to say, as we said here, as I said earlier, make sure that you don't understand your, your work and you never understand it. So that's very important. So that's the main point. You need to find the right budget for the committee to work that you want to be funded by your funding. And you really emphasize this last point because oftentimes, especially newer grant writers, think that they will be more competitive if they put forth a two-year budget. Like, oh, they'll be more likely to fund this because I'm lowballing and I look so uh, efficient and convincing. But the ones who are particularly skillful super experienced, what in fact reviewers see is somebody who doesn't understand how much it costs to do that. So you want to hit the sweet spot. You don't want to pad the budget because they'll also be able to fall back. But you don't want to look like you don't understand how, how much time is going to take to do something and how much it costs to do something. Um, so um, a good strategy is to find other budgets for comparable work and to see how people do it. Uh, use the expertise of your uh, program managers as well and ask them to give you a kind of reality check if you're all trying to do that. You want to get that Another issue, so many times people ask, well, maybe I should have the budget because I hear sometimes that budgets are coming back with, yes, we're going to give you the award, but you ask for this much and only this thing. Um, Michelle, sometimes you've talked about sort of chunking things. You want to talk a little bit about that strategy rather than padding with the budget, what's mm -hmm. an alternative? I'll talk about that and then and then what we actually mean by padding, um, just because um, people are thinking, well, I'm going to tuck $1,000 here. That's not necessarily what we mean by padding. Um, padding would be, um, you know, like, I'm going to ask for 100000 and the project's really quite small. <laughs> but if you, you know, for private funders, very often you will not get what you ask for. I think in the federal case, it's usually if you ask for this much, they'll either tell you yes or no. Private funders almost always give you a little less than you ask for. So you want to make sure you reflect what would be your ideal budget and then also be thoughtful about what happens if they come back with a little bit less. So that's the part where um, this is the project I want to do. I have all these things I want to accomplish, but no funder is going to fund all of this for me. So if I can do year one, for this component of it, um, that might be the budget I'm looking for because the funder only funds 100,000. My <laughs> whole project costs 300,000, but I'm not going to get anybody first thing out of the, you know, up my first proposal to get 300,000. So I'm going to chunk it up into what seems a little more practical for the particular funder and hopefully getting that first grant. We always say when you have money is the best time to ask for more money because when you have a successful proposal, then funders are more likely to look at you and go, oh, they were successful and look at, you know, they're doing something now, so we'll give them more money. So oftentimes we'll say, if this is what you want to do overall, grand scheme of your research or project, think about smaller components to that. So you, if you did year one and got some more funding, you could do the rest of it and you can build on that. Um, they don't have to necessarily be like, I finish it and there's nothing more to do and I have just a different project, but sort of chunking it up and that's part of what we can um, discuss with you if you're thinking I want this much but I'm not finding a funder that funds this is there something you could scale down um, that would fit a little bit better yeah that's it and I just thought I was going to talk to you right there <laughs> uh, 
Um, so that's one strategy, but also just being thoughtful as you put forth even a single proposal with the awareness that you might get a yes, but a reduced amount, and you don't want to be at a loss at that point. You put in for 100 and they say yes to 70. If you've already thought in advance, okay, I can do these pieces, but not this piece, uh, one year, but not two years, you've done that thinking, then you're prepared to go back to them and say, okay, I'll take the 70, but be aware, it's not gonna be the whole pie anymore. It's gonna be two thirds of it in these ways. And that's another, also um, an added reason for not skimping on your budget. Like I can barely do it with this amount of money. If nothing changes, nothing goes over budget, I don't need to spend any more time. Um, if my students can get it all done in the time I've budgeted, be thoughtful about what is really realistic because um, you know they do come back with a little bit slighter budget. Like, okay, I, you know, what can I take out? But if there's just no possible way you could do it with anything less than what's in your budget, um, it's gonna be a challenge for you if you are funded. I um, mean, the worst thing that can happen is, you know, obviously you get it, you get the award, you're excited, you start the project and you fail. That's the worst thing that can happen. So you wanna be um, planful about what you include in there, um, not skimp, not pad, <laughs> but again, that sweet spot. Okay, and uh, we have just a few minutes left, but this is a really important part of the budget package. Uh, the justification serves two purposes. It explains how the costs were estimated and justifies the need for the cost. I think we talked about it a lot, but I mean, they have to align everything. Yeah, so, so what the budget narrative is is actually um, like a little essay we have describing mm -hmm. what you're doing in the budget, what you fund for, why you need that money, and um, why you need that much money. Do you want to add anything to that? Yes. So this is one part where you have to be careful how you justify the strategic support. Because when you say, oh, I want one on, on two on the top, you don't want to say, I need it on two or eight times because I want to reduce my teaching load. That's not the way to sell it to the funder. What you want to do is, I need on two because I have to do all of those, these, all of those steps in my proposed work. So I, I am concerned that I am mentoring students or I'm doing uh, this experiment or uh, I am in charge of uh, doing all of those steps. So this is all you, sh you should do. Don't go to the way you say it's to reduce my teaching load. In a way, the funder or the reviewer, they don't want to hear that. What they want to hear or read is what do you do for that time? And this is a way that you can really show why you are asking for one, two, one, four, all this time during the academic year and one or two months for the funder or the report. So that's very important. Yes? I'm wondering, so just with the budget, it's not part of what you were saying, but it's part of now, this is in the budget justification. Yeah, because for each category of your budget, you need to provide, as any said, a description of why you need on time supply, or why you need your time, or why you need to hire a research assistant. So this is where you will justify and you will show that on time, oh, I need to go to this library because I need to look at some uh, books or whatever. So you need to explain. So that's the budget. Um, like a chunk of um, do you make your chunks to the happiest or do you try to pick them out? I would say no. What, I, mean, I guess, what, what did you, broadly speaking, what do you have in mind? You make the budget of your perspective, you know, what chunks I can pull out. I was just wondering, like, do you try to make sure the chunks are not obvious here or the chunks are obvious? From the private foundations, it depends. Um, if you are, let's see if I can give a good example. Um, if you are doing a three-year project and each year is something slightly different um, and you're asking for $100,000 for each year, if you're not sure if the funder is willing to give you three years worth, in that particular case, it may be useful to say, year one, I'm doing X, Y, Z, year two, your three, because if they come back to you and say, we can't give you 300, but we can give you 200 to fund the first two years, then it makes it really easy for them. If your project isn't set up in that way, they're, you know, and you're doing sort of the same thing each year, but you're collecting more data as you go along, then you may not need to differentiate that as 
that kind of chunking um, as okay. much. Does that make sort of yeah, sense yeah. with what you have in mind? The other point uh, we are concerned for the, the category of materials and supplies. If you do the price, how I need to see the barrier. doesn't mean anything. So you need to explain that maybe for the public care, and I will give you an example in science, which is work for me, for my background. I need, I don't know, 10 cases of soda, 10 cases of chemicals, 10 cases for a small accessory. And in fact, I can mention if I request 50 cases for each year for a three year plan, I said this is what I use per year. And that's why I will request the same amount for three years. So those are the ways just to give some ideas. Because if you just say I want the people for 50 years, nobody knows what it is. So that's also how to do it. I was going to add something. So when you were talking about like chunking things together, a uh, common thing I see whenever you're building out this budget and you're talking about like the participant costs. In the narrative, you might say that you're trying to get 300 people and you're going to give them $100 for participation costs. And if it comes back less, then well, maybe it's 200 people, but you're only going to give them $20. So that could be something that you change if it's less. That's one of the things. So you want to describe it as In your narrative, you're actually saying it's letting uh, Tower Research know that you're trying to go out for 300 people at right. so much. Okay. So I think I'm not, I, we'll go through, I'll see if there's examples as part of the presentation. If there's no, if they're not, I do have examples. I can pro project them so you can kind of see what a budget narrative looks like. Um, so that was our informational portion of the workshop today. What I want to do now is review some of the tools that we sent you via email if you were on the list. And we do have some hard copies here if you want to use them. Um, before I uh, go into those, though, I want to just mention how this uh, series of workshops relates to the University Grants Academy opportunity. Um, if you're interested in the University Grants Academy opportunity, that's a spring semester opportunity where you receive a point to assign time to devote to the writing of an external grant proposal to a funder that's significant for your discipline, a funding opportunity that's significant for your discipline. We understand that varies. Uh, the application is due in early November. It's um, a little bit different than it was in prior years. It includes pieces of a proposal draft, including uh, about five pages of the narrative, the budget, the budget justification, your CV, and an application page. So if you uh, go through this workshop series and you stick around for the workshops and you actually develop those pieces that we're suggesting that you do, a draft of the budget, then you're well on your way to a complete application for the UGA. So three of these workshops, well, two, two of them, this one and the next one, no, yeah, um, will happen before the UGA application and you use those pieces as part of your application. The fourth one comes after the application is due and that's on finding a funder. Okay, so I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, you don't have to apply for the UGA, but this will be a nice assistance if in fact you do. Yeah. So two points uh, before uh, she mentioned the next step. One about the UGA application. You can find all the information if you go to the Office of Research website. Make sure you use this one because we are working on some web pages that you may find uh, somewhere else on the university website that are broken, which are not the right one. So make sure if you need something about the UGA, uh, go to the Office of Research website and then there will be a tab uh, named uh, Fundy. You go under funding opportunities and you have the UGA for sure. And if you don't, you are not sure, you can always contact me and go to the research and I will let you know where to be. But make sure that. So that's one point. The second, make sure that I think there are still uh, the, the sign up sheet uh, going around. If you haven't signed up, make sure you do it because uh, we will use that to send you the materials and the recording once it's available. So if you, if you haven't done it, make sure that you sign up. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
So for the tools, and then after we go through the tools, there'll be a break. Folks who don't want to stay can leave. Folks who do want to stay can get a glass of water and then come back. Um, so we have a couple of different kinds of tools. The first tool I'm going to show you is for those of you who are just beginning to work on your budget. And it's um, designed as sort of like a series of questions about your project that you simply answer. And the answers then will help you figure out how much money you need. So it is this one, the cost development worksheet. And you're just going to go through, think about, well, how much time do I need? How many students do I need? Am I going to be working with other people? How much time will they need? And you just go through, describe what it is you need, and then fill it out. It, you'll be both well on your way to the budget justification with this, if you actually answer the questions and write them down, and also to the budget itself in terms of the spreadsheet document. So this is a great tool to start with if you're more of a beginning place in terms of thinking about your project. So the question is, um, thinking about writing a collaborative proposal, how does that relate to the UGA experience and eligibility for that, and how does that work with the budget? So first, in regards to the UGA, that's fine. But you do want to keep in mind that the UGA is designed to develop you as a PI. So we're interested in you as a PI and you frame your application in that way. Um, you can always, uh, many people in the UGA did work with others at this university and outside this university as co-PIs, but um, the opportunity is designed to support you as a PI. So your, your project needs to move along at the rate that it will for um, the semester in the spring. For a budget, there's a couple of different ways that you could work with a collaborator. Um, if they're at another university, um, Angela or Michelle can maybe talk a little bit about the subcontracting process. Either you would be a subcontract if the grant went to their university, and they would buy your time. Or if you're the primary PI, the grant comes to this university, and you do a subcontract to their university to pay for their time. So that's something you'll just need to think about. Is that the essence of it? Is there anything else? That's the essence of it. One more, and then, because I want to make sure we get to this. Jill, do you have any feedback or expertise to offer? Huh? Uh, talking about subcontracts, working with another at another university, she's interested in collaborating with somebody at a major R1. So I would say that it's fine. What I would say in terms of collaboration, you have to be careful. You want to show that you need this expertise. Either you bring an expertise that the person doesn't have, or this person will bring an expertise that you need for your work. As long as you look at that aspect of the collaboration, I don't think that that will be a problem. But where it could be a challenge, especially for the world, if they think that, oh, by the way, you put this name because this one is well known in the field, and by having the name on this proposal, I have a better chance of getting the proposal. So that's what's important. Uh, the collaboration is it's uh, something that is uh, very important now because we know that most of the time you cannot do everything yourself so you don't have the expertise. So having collaborations that are well documented is uh, well appreciated. So that's what uh, I would say. Okay. So um, how many people think they want to start here with the cost development worksheet? If you want to start um Okay, I think the way I'll run through the tools and then when we're done with that, then if you want this tool, you didn't get it emailed, come up to the front and we'll give you a hard copy. Okay, second tool is actually a budget template, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it has embedded within it some of the formulas for calculating fringe rates and things like that. 
Um, and this is a good starting point for either auxiliary, right? They can take it and tweak it as they need. Um, some of it won't be relevant for power, but the basic premise will be the same in terms of the budget category. So if you're ready to start with that, this is a good tool to use. If you, if you already know all your project elements and you just want to get it all down and add it up. Um, we also have um, a template for the budget justification. That's sort of the little essay that you write about your budget, why you're getting asking for what you are and why you need that much money. And it just has the various headings from the budget and you just write a little paragraph in each section justifying why you need the money and why you need that much money. Um, there is another format for this that's more of a table version. Um, uh, it's the default one that Paul says that Tower uses if funder doesn't request a particular format for the budget justification. So we also have that available to you. Um, so what I want to say, like I said at our last workshop, is just, um, I, you know, it's one pen. We'll take a break for one fifteen. You can go off if you wish, but I really strongly encourage you to stay. Even if this doesn't feel like your ideal work environment, because there's other people here, um, it's still crowded. Um, it's super hard to find the time to do this kind of work, especially if you don't have a, a real hard deadline, right? It's hard to just expend the time and the energy to get it done. But if you just stay and take advantage of the 45 minutes that you and we have found for you in your work week to get a draft done, then, then you have something to work with. And it's always so much easier to work with a draft of something than to work with a white paper. So, um, just stick around. There's experts here who can help you figure stuff out. They may even be able to find your fringe rate, possibly, uh, to give you that exact number um, to plug in. Um, so please stay. Um, anything else that anybody wants to say? I think the major two things I would want to leave you with is don't worry about it. It's really not that hard. People are always super interested in this workshop and feel like they have to know all these nuts and bolts and figures and calculations and things. And you really don't. You just need to know who your program officer is and sit down and have a conversation with them. Work comes to work. I think it's useful to understand how this works so that you can um, be aware of it as you develop your project, but you can always just do that. And the second thing is just to know who these people are and know you can go to them and know who this gentleman is, and though you can always go to him if you have any question about drafting an external grant report. Okay, any questions? No? Okay. Um, so one more thing we want to offer you is that if you are applying for the UGA, or even if you, you're not, if you do draft your budget and your budget justification, you can send those to Dr. Mueller, and he will either review them for you and give you some critical feedback, or find somebody on campus and that will be very useful if you're applying to the UGA or if you're applying to an external fund. So I really encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, then at some point, if you're definitely going for an opportunity, you want to meet with your conference program manager and work out the budget details with them. And then we encourage you to uh, come to the next workshop on drafting the narrative in later October, probably also in this room? No, I think it will be most likely engineering 285 to 285. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much for your attendance and hope to see many of you stay here for the next 45 minute portion of the workshop. If you need any hard copies, or actually, I can also email you right now any versions of these if you like. Oh, you didn't? Okay, you do want to use.